Whether you're joining us from Virginia or Texas or California or somewhere in between, whether you're in the United States or outside of the U United States, and whether you're here in our live interactive webinar platform or in our YouTube stream or in a recorded session, we welcome you to today's webinar, The Low FODMAP Diet for Irritable Bowel Syndrome, From Evidence to Practice. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jen Schielek, Webinar Coordinator, and I'd like to call your attention to the link on the slide and in the chat window at the bottom left of your screen. That link will connect you to slides, handouts, and other event materials available for you to get now or later at learn.extension.org slash events slash 3300. That link is also available in the recorded session to get the event materials for today's webinar. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD-USDA partnership, and we welcome you to today's event. Our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. You've let those of you who have been joining us in our live internet platform have already shared some about where you're joining us from, but we'd like to get a little bit more information about you. So if you would take a minute to just fill out this quick poll telling us a little bit about your current employer. Which of the listed choices would be the best pick for who you affiliate with as your current employer? If you do choose other, please specify in the chat window when we get back to that screen and tell us a little bit more about your employer. We'll leave this window up for just a moment to allow you to select from the available choices. A lot of folks from the VA here today and from the other branches as well. Thank you for taking the time to fill out that poll. Let me go ahead and get back to the main event. And again, if you chose other there, if you would share what you would have chosen had it been there. But now back to the reason we're all here. Let me turn the microphone over to Kristen, who will introduce herself Thanks. and our speaker. Kristen? Thank you, Jen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kristen DiFilippo. I am the Professional Education Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network Nutrition and Wellness Concentration Area. Today I am so excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Caroline Tuck. Dr. Tuck is an Australian accredited practicing dietitian with experience in clinical practice and in research. She also completed her PhD with the FODMAPS research team at Monash University. Currently, she is undertaking a postdoctoral research fellowship at Queen's University in Canada, focusing on understanding the physiological effects of diet on the gastrointestinal tract. Dr. Dr. Tuck has published a number of scientific journal articles and received many awards, including the Award of Excellence in Nutrition and Dietary Fiber Research at the Nutrition Society of Australia Conference in 2016. I want to thank Dr. Tuck for sharing her expertise on the low FODMAP diet with us today. And at this time, I can hand it over to Dr. Tuck. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for joining in. I've really been looking forward to this uh, webinar. Um, so as discussed, we're planning to talk today about the low FODMAP diet and specifically looking at how it can be used for patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And what I wanted to provide was um, of information both about um, the evidence that we have about the low FODMAP diet, but how this evidence um, you can use in your own practice. So at the end of this session, I'm hoping that you'll be able to describe the mechanisms of action and evidence for the use of the low FODMAP diet in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. And I'm hoping you'll be familiar with the concepts of the three phases of um, implementing the low FODMAP diet and be able to discuss ways in which the diet can be modified to suit, suit the needs of the individual or suit the needs of your patients. 
So today, firstly, we're going to start with a little bit about diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome, talk about the low FODMAP diet mechanisms of action and scientific evidence um, for the diet, the application of the low FODMAP diet in practice and some adjunct therapies that dietitians can be utilising, and ways in which the diet can be individualised to the patient. So firstly, to talk a little bit about irritable bowel syndrome. So irritable bowel syndrome is quite a common condition affecting around 10% of Western population and causes symptoms such as abdominal pain, bloating, flatulence or gas, constipation and diarrhoea. Now we don't fully understand the exact cause of IBS but it is thought to be related to a number of potential mechanisms. So it may be that in some patients there are changes in the motility of the GI tract or the movement through the bowel. There may be alterations to the microbiota. There may be visceral hypersensitivity, so the patient is more um, able to feel changes in distension in the GI tract. And maybe immune activation. And there have been many other postulated mechanisms of IBS. And we don't know, potentially, in some patients, certain mechanisms may be more uh, relevant than others. The types, severity, and combination of symptoms can be quite different from patient to patient. So it doesn't always present in the same way. So diagnosis of um, IBS is based on a symptom criteria after the exclusion of all other GI conditions. So for example, after celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease has been excluded. Currently, the Rome 4 criteria is used uh, to diagnose IBS. And within this Rome 4 criteria, it is stated that patients should have recurrent abdominal pain on average at least one day per week in the last three months, associated with two or more of the following. So that needs to be associated with uh, defecation, or with a change in frequency of stool, or change in form or appearance of the stool. And the patient should be able to fulfill this criteria for the last three months, with symptom onset at least six months before diagnosis. So importantly, when we're looking at patients um, and talking to them about their symptoms, it's really important to think about any potential red flags. So red flags are something that might indicate to you that perhaps this patient may not have IBS and maybe they need further medical review. So this could be, for example, they've had unexplained weight loss, they're aged over 50 years, or they're having nocturnal symptoms. So if a patient is getting up overnight, um, to use their bowels or having symptoms overnight, that is often a sign that it is not IBS. If they are having uh, rectal bleeding, iron deficiency, or if they have a family history of colon cancer or fecal soiling, these are all things that might indicate that perhaps it is not IBS and perhaps we need to be referring back to uh, the doctors to do further investigation. Now these red flags are important for dietitians to keep in mind, especially for example if a patient has self-referred to come and see you. So if they've, um, they've not seen a, do a doctor, or they've not talked to someone already about their symptoms, it's really important that we, we look out for these red flags before we start to implement any dietary changes. So who should we be thinking about the low FODMAP diet for? So someone who we might, um, we might consider the low FODMAP diet would be a patient who has spoken to their doctor about their symptoms. It might be someone who has had appropriate tests. For example, they have um, had a celiac disease ruled out or inflammatory bowel disease ruled out. Or someone that has seen a gastroenterologist about their symptoms. Patients who we don't want to um, use a low FODMAP diet in might be someone that does not have any current IBS symptoms. It might be someone who is trying to lose weight because that's not what this diet is designed for. It might be someone who has experienced IBS symptoms but has not yet spoken to a doctor about it. 
or perhaps someone who thinks they have some food sensitivities but again hasn't spoken to their doctor or had any tests done. It's really important that before we change any dietary intake such as uh, reducing intake of gluten that celiac disease has been properly excluded. So what evidence do we have at this stage around the low FODMAP diet? Um, so the low FODMAP diet was originally developed by the research team at Monash University in Australia around 10 years ago. Now studies um, have been done worldwide which have shown efficacy for reducing symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome and it's really important that now there is research from a number of different countries which we'll talk about shortly um, showing efficacy of the diet. The use of the diet has been supported by a number of meta-analyses that have looked at um, pooling results from a number of studies. But something that uh, so far the research is really showing is that the diet should be used under the guidance of a dietitian. And that is largely because most, uh, most of the studies that have been done to date have really been um, through a dietitian taught therapy. So no studies really have evaluated the use um, of the diet when it's been self-taught or um, through other means. So what is this word FODMAP? So FODMAP is an acronym and it stands for fermentable, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols. Really what this means and how I like to explain it to patients is it means fermentable carbohydrates or fermentable sugars and it's really talking about specific types of carbohydrates or sugars. We're not talking about all types of carbohydrates. Now you can see on the little diagram there on the right that there are different uh, subgroups uh, that uh, classify as being FODMAPs. So fructose is a monosaccharide, lactose a disaccharide, fructan and GOS or galacto-oligosaccharides both count as types of oligosaccharides and sugar polyols. Now often foods will contain one or a number of these different FODMAPs within the same food. And we do think that often when patients um, are most symptomatic might be when they're um, in the middle of that diagram, so when there's a build-up effect or an overlap. So if they're consuming multiple types of high FODMAP foods within the same um, day or within the same meal, that's when they're most likely to, to become symptomatic. So what we wanted to do now was uh, direct you to watch a short YouTube clip. The link is um, there um, on the slide. And this YouTube clip will give you a little bit of background around the mechanism of action and how FODMAPs can create symptoms in IBS patients.
Okay, so it looks like uh, lots of you are back from the YouTube clip. I hope you found that um, a nice little video and a nice explanation. I think it's a, a really great way to um, actually show patients and can be something that you can use, utilize in clinics to, to show patients uh, what we're talking about and how the diet might actually help to improve symptoms. Um, so certainly it, it can be really helpful to have some tools in your clinic. So uh, if you are using the diet already in practice, perhaps in the, the chat window you can let us know how much or how often you're using the diet at the moment. And if you do have any um, tools that you use such as this video or other ways that you explain um, the diet to the patient. Okay, so um, giving you a little bit more background around the mechanisms of action of FODMAP. So in that video it talked about the osmotic effect. So the fact that FODMAPs can actually um, draw more water into the small intestinal lumen. So this was a really nice study done by a group in the UK where they used MRI uh, technology to um, look at how different types of FODMAPs were affecting the GI tract. So if you have a look on um, the diagrams that are on the slide here, you'll see in uh, picture A where they've used glucose, which is a placebo, there's not a lot of white light. Now I'm no expert in, um, in interpreting MRI images, but in the papers they talk about the white light um, acting or showing us where the, the osmotic action is occurring or where there's more water delivery. So with glucose you can see that it's fairly minimal. But if you look at uh, panel B, you see with fructose, which is one of the monosaccharides, you can see that there's a lot of white light in the small intestine, showing that fructose is having an osmotic action on the small intestine. If you then look across to panel D with fructan, which is one of the oligosaccharides, you see that there's less of that white light. So showing us that FODMAPs actually have different mechanisms of action depending on the type of FODMAP. So here fructose is causing the osmotic action more so than fructan. If we then though look, this is from the same study, they looked at the colonic gas volume. And you'll see in this graph here in the green line, you'll see that fructan created more gas or there was a higher colonic gas volume with fructan. So whilst the fructan did not create that osmotic action, uh, the fructan did create an increase in gas production. So we know these two mechanisms of action of FODMAPs, so increasing water delivery and increasing gas production. Um, there are other mechanisms that have been proposed, such as potentially affecting immune activation, uh, but we need some more studies and more robust, robust uh, evaluation of those mechanisms before um, uh, before we, we talk about those too much. But certainly I find with working with patients where you can explain this gas production and this increase in water delivery, it can really um, help patients understand why, um, why you're suggesting to try the diet. Um, so the evidence for the low FODMAP diet um, is, is growing and certainly we see that symptoms improve in patients with um, IBS but not so much in healthy controls which is actually a really good thing. So this has been shown in a study uh, by Emma Helmos um, from the group at Monash University where you can see in the, um, the left graph this is patients with IBS. You can see when they followed a typical Australian diet or a higher FODMAP diet, their symptoms were higher than when they were on the low FODMAP diet which is in that dotted line below. If you compare that to the healthy controls in the graph on the right, you can see that the healthy controls really didn't have a lot of symptoms uh, to start with. But you can also see there's no difference on a, a typical Australian diet or a low FODMAP diet in the healthy controls. So showing us uh, that, um, that there is no difference uh, for healthy controls. So it's not something that uh, healthy controls um, need to, or healthy people need to be following. We then now see that there's um, lots of evidence 
coming out from around the world. So um, a study published in 2016 by the group at the University of Michigan um, looked at the low FODMAP diet compared to a modified NICE diet, which is another diet proposed to help with um, symptoms of IBS. And you can see that more patients responded to the low FODMAP diet, so showing that the diet was effective. Now across these studies, they've obviously all used slightly different study designs, but you can see um, the paper from, from Canada, which is the group where I'm currently working, they saw a reduction in symptoms with the low FODMAP diet after three weeks. Uh, the group from the UK at King's College in London, uh, this paper from Heidi Staudacker, showed an improvement in the overall symptom score. And another group in Denmark, um, again showing improvement with a low FODMAP diet. Now I've just uh, picked a, a range of studies here. There are plenty more out there that have looked at, it, uh, looked at the low FODMAP diet and shown improvements. Um, now this study by Ruth Harvey, which came from some data from New Zealand, um, is a really nice study to show us a little bit more about what happens uh, more after the the rechallenge effect or more in the long term. So if you look at the graph on the left, you can see change in FODMAP intake. So this is how much FODMAP um, content there is in their diet. Now at baseline, their FODMAP intake is higher. And then at three months, the FODMAP intake is reduced. So they go on the low FODMAP diet and they're eating less FODMAPs. But then what you can see nicely is at six months um, after the treatment, their FODMAP intake does actually increase again. So this is showing through the re-challenge um, uh, process that their FODMAP intake is able to be um, increased and patients are able to bring more FODMAPs back in the diet. Now if you then compare that graph over to the graph on the right, you'll see this is their symptom score or their IBS symptom severity score. So their symptoms at baseline are higher as expected and then their symptoms reduce with the low FODMAP diet at three months. But you can see at six months their symptoms are still pretty good, they're still reduced. Um, and this is despite the fact that they've managed to increase some uh, FODMAP intake in their diet. So it's really showing that after re-challenging, which we'll talk about um, shortly, that you can really still increase um, uh, symptom improvement. Um, but as with side effects from drugs, there are always side effects to think about or long-term safety concerns. Um, whenever we're modifying diet, we have potential to affect uh, nutritional adequacy. Um, and what data we have to date suggests that um, the nutritional adequacy is um, largely maintained. Um, there is thought that maybe we reduce quality of life because we make it more difficult for perhaps um, patients to eat out or eat with friends and that can affect quality of life. Although again to date uh, studies have shown improvements to quality of life due to improved symptoms. And there's also a bit of talk about the alterations in the microbiota. So there's been some concern that maybe we're reducing some of the good bacteria such as the bifidobacteria. Um, and for this uh, we don't really understand exactly um, what's happening in the long term, partially because um, we don't understand uh, really what a healthy microbiota is and a lot of research is needed in this area. But because of these um, potential um, detrimental effects of using the dietary therapy, it's important that we don't leave patients on the diet in the long term, um, which we're going to talk about shortly. But we might just stop here for a question break. Um, yeah, Caroline, we've had a couple of questions so far. Um, Captain Dorma Sanders asks, how young can someone start this diet? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, a lot of the studies have been done um, in adults. Um, however, there are a couple of studies that have been done in children. Um, and look, to be honest, it, it can be used in, in children fairly young. Um, and obviously in that situation, you might be um, educating the parents um, on what to provide the child. I guess the key thing is when we're using it in, in younger patients is really to make sure that uh, we're not af affecting any food aversions or anything like that and again that it would be used in, in a short term way. 
Um, some some people suggest as well with younger, for example, children who might be drinking lots of apple juice or something, it might actually not be completing a full low FODMAP diet, but you might be able to just modify a few things that are really high in FODMAP content um, rather than implementing the whole thing in, in um, younger children. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Joanne asked, would this diet possibly help slow transit constipation, which she has seen as a huge problem in veteran populations? Yeah, look, um, with the uh, different, I guess, different um, subgroups, of IBS, uh, there is evidence to help so with constipation. Um, the flip side is possible that you can utilise high FODMAP foods to try and improve constipation by utilising that osmotic effect. So for example, if you tried a low FODMAP diet and it didn't help, you could actually try and utilise the, the fructose or the polyols that are more likely to bring extra water into the bowel and see if that additional water could help um, improve constipation. So I guess that's where a little bit of trial and error and manipulation with a dietitian can really um, you know, help um, from both ends of the spectrum. So kind of a reverse strategy. Correct, yeah. So uh, Mallory, um, Ma yeah. So Mallory asks if following a low FODMAP diet would reduce the possible need for daily IBS medications. Yes, well, certainly. So um, it is always tricky when uh, trying multiple, I guess, modalities of therapy at once to know what is helping. So if you're trying medication and diet at the same time, it's, it's hard to know. Um, but certainly um, some patients do well with simply uh, utilising diet and don't need medication at all, so definitely something that could happen. Yeah. Uh, Megan wondered, are there recommended probiotics? Um, yes, yeah, so probiotics is a, I guess, a really hot topic, um, but also a bit of a controversial one, in that a lot of the research studies uh, that have been done have all used different strains of probiotics in different doses for different lengths of time. And so it's very difficult um, from a research perspective to try and sort of pull that data together and get a firm answer as to whether or not probiotics are beneficial. Certainly some studies have shown that they are, but some studies have shown that they're not. Um, so generally I would recommend using a bit of a trial and error approach with probiotics. Certainly in clinical practice I've had patients that have um, done well on them, but I think it's something that you try for a short period of time and reevaluate. Uh, rather than saying, yep, give them a go and patients keep taking them with potentially no benefit. So important to, to trial, but um, certainly to evaluate if it's helpful or not. That makes sense. So Amanda says she had a doctor recommend the low FODMAP diet for a patient with severe dermatitis. Is that appropriate? Um, that is a good question. I don't believe there's any um, research papers at the moment that have looked at the low FODMAP diet in dermatitis. There is certainly um, starting to be, I guess, um, some studies that are looking at the low FODMAP diet in other conditions other than IBS, such as in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and uh, endometriosis, but I've not heard of um, dermatitis. Um, I guess whether or not that patient had any other GI symptoms, maybe they thought it was worth a try, but for dermatitis itself, um, not that I know of. And I will keep track of the questions that are continuing to come in, but I think so in the interest of time, I'm going to let Dr. Tuck go on, and then if we have time at the end, I'll make sure to ask some of the questions that we haven't got a chance to at this question break. Okay. So we're going to move on now to a little bit about implementing the diet in practice. So really it's important to think about the diet as a three-step process. And I do put there that it should be undertaken by the guidance of a dietitian. And this is largely because the majority of studies to date have been um, um, done with a dietitian intervention throughout. So there's really not a lot of evidence to show how the diet works without the guidance of the dietitian. 
So the three phases that we're going to talk to is phase one where patients reduce their total FODMAP intake. Um, and you can see there we're talking about reducing their intake. It doesn't have to be that they have no FODMAPs in their diet, but reducing their intake. Phase two is re-challenging to assess tolerance. And phase three is the long-term maintenance. So phase one where we reduce the FODMAP intake uh, is usually for around two to six weeks. Um, and patients need to understand from the beginning that they're not to be trying to follow this strict diet forever or anything like that. But it is a trial period where we um, try to reduce the amount that they're consuming and then we can re-challenge afterwards. It is important to explain to them the mechanisms of action. So for example, using the YouTube clip that you've just watched or um, other diagrams that might help them understand why the low FODMAP diet will help their symptoms. And also important to remember that you can modify the level of restriction to meet the needs of the individual patient. So like before, we talked about in a, in a young child who maybe is drinking lots of apple juice, it may just be uh, taking that out for, for some patients. Or um, it might be looking at their diet history and seeing what they're eating a lot of. Maybe not every patient needs to go on, on, a, on the, the full version of the diet. And this is something that hasn't been fully studied in the literature, but um, certainly in practice we find can be useful just to uh, look at specific foods from their food diary. So here I've just popped a table with some examples of high, and food, high FODMAP foods and low FODMAP alternatives. Um, I think we were in the, the chat window at the start just talking about the importance of um, actually talking to patients um, uh, about low FODMAP alternatives and spending a little bit of time on that and discussing things that they could um, swap in and out of their diet. So instead of having an apple, for example, they could eat an orange or instead of using garlic in their cooking, they could use a garlic infused oil. I have also put a note on there that um, the FODMAP content of foods is constantly being evaluated and researched at Monash University. So it's important to always be keeping updated, updated with um, changes in FODMAP food lists or new foods that might be analysed. Um, and the Monash University um, smartphone app is a good way um, for both dietitians and patients to, to stay up to date with that. Uh, so phase two is the re-challenge phase. So this is really a key part to try and assess which of the FODMAPs are troublesome in each particular patient. Again, encouraged to do this um, under guidance of a dietitian. It's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach, which we'll talk about in a moment. But really the aim is to look at re-challenging to find a balance between having good symptom control and expanding the diet. So the diet really only needs to be as strict as symptoms um, uh, require them to be. So here I've popped a table in from a, a paper that uh, myself and Dr. Jackie Barrett, also from Monash University, wrote, um, where we, we basically discussed the re-challenge phase. And we gave some examples in this table here of different foods that could be used um, for each of the different FODMAP subgroups. So how we suggest um, patients re-challenge is via subgroup rather than testing every individual food, as that would be um, would, would take quite a bit of time. And you can see there I've, I've suggested some things you might think about with your patients. So uh, what food does the patient like to try? So um, if you're suggesting they do a challenge for excess fructose, if the patient doesn't like honey but loves mango, you might suggest they use mango. Um, what uh, types of quantities of these foods do they normally eat? Um, you know, if they don't eat a lot of milk or they don't drink a lot of milk but um, they have up to maybe half a cup, then you might just utilise that as your, your quantity that you recommend. And importantly, what has the biggest impact on nutritional adequacy? So for example, in a vegetarian patient, you might want to get them to do the GOF challenge or the the, the legumes um, sooner rather than later to get some protein into their diet. We do know that tolerance seems to be variable between uh, patients for each subgroup. So I've put some examples from some studies here. 
But for example, we found 68% of patients were sensitive or reacted to the GOS um, in one of the studies we did, which means 32% of patients can actually tolerate that um, quite well. So importantly, we want to help patients interpret what the challenges mean and I would suggest that you get patients to be writing down what their symptoms are like throughout challenges. Um, and um, if patients have really severe symptoms, um, they might avoid that food for now but re-challenge it in the future. If they have manageable symptoms, uh, perhaps they can reintroduce that food maybe on less frequent occasions, perhaps when they're at home. Um, so they, they know if they have a little bit of bloating or gas, but they're going to be at home for the day that it's okay to, to eat that particular food. And then foods that they tolerate well, they can reintrodu reintroduce back into their diet and trial larger serving sizes. And then the long-term maintenance phase really, again, should only be followed as strictly as needed. So patients should reintroduce any foods that um, they can back into the diet. And long term, patients should keep re-challenging foods. So for example, if they uh, tried some onion in the initial re-challenge and they reacted to it, they should try that a little bit of onion again in three or six months' time and assess if they're still reacting in the same way. If the diet doesn't help improve symptoms, which we know perhaps maybe one in every four patients will not improve with the low FODMAP diet. Um, there's no point continuing on them um, and they should return to their usual diet and then perhaps think about um, other dietary or non-dietary options to help manage their symptoms. Um, so we're up to another question break. I think I saw in the, the conversations there what is GOS? So GOS is a galacto-oligosaccharide or one of the oligosaccharide groups. Um, and it's present mainly in legumes, nuts, soy milk, uh, those sorts of foods uh, are mostly high in GOS. Did we have some other questions as well? We did. One of the questions was, should you re-challenge one food in each subgroup or pick one subgroup at a time? So I would um, suggest that you um, pick one food from the subgroup to represent that subgroup and to do one challenge at a time. So it might be that you challenge that particular food. If you chose mango for fructose, you might challenge that for three days, for example, um, and test tolerance, and then um, wait a little bit, maybe wait a couple of days, and then move on to a lactose challenge, for example. Okay, thank you. Um, Another question was, how much does keeping a diary help patients to minimize symptoms? Yeah, look, I think um, food diaries are very helpful, but um, when a patient continues uh, a food diary in the long term, it can sometimes be at the detriment too. It makes patients almost focus too much on what's going on. Um, so often I think a food diary is helpful perhaps for, for a week or two around the time of um, trying the low FODMAP diet. Uh, maybe you might get them to do a food diary before they see you so that you can then um, evaluate what they're currently eating and what their current FODMAP intake is. And then during re-challenge, it may not be a full food diary, but it might be just writing down what the challenge food was. So maybe again, they tried mango, um, and then writing down what their symptoms were in, in response to that food. Um, so I think diaries can be really helpful, but um, not in the longer term. Okay, and then one more question. Is the improved tolerance usually related um, to the individual starting to recognize how much of a food they can tolerate and they limit the combination of offenders? Or is there actually a change in the microbiome that helps over time? Mm, good question, and unfortunately I don't have really the answer for you. Um, so certainly it could quite possibly be that um, once they're on the diet, they're more aware of which uh, foods they react to and which foods they don't, or as you said, perhaps the quantity that they can um, tolerate. So it certainly could be that, um, or perhaps because we're using the diet, we are altering the microbiome and it's um, uh, alterations in gas production potentially. We just don't have the research data, unfortunately, yet to know the answer 
um, to that, but certainly something I think that's really interesting and, and might be something that comes out of some studies that, um, that are sort of um, on the go or, or um, happening at the moment. Okay. And as before, I will continue to collect questions, but I'm going to uh, let Dr. Tuck continue on at this point. Great. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was some adjunct therapies. Now this is really things that you could implement um, at the time um, to try and improve tolerance to a particular FODMAP subgroup, for example. So these are things you could use um, in conjunction with a low FODMAP diet. One of these you might be um, already familiar with, which is the lactase um, supplementation or the lactase enzyme. So we know that lactase production can reduce, certainly um, with age, uh, in, the, in the small intestine. So um, we, we find lactase supplementation can be useful for those that are lactose intolerant. And this can be done in two forms. So one would be pre-incubated with food products like in a lactose-free milk or it can be supplemented such as a tablet form. Now one study that I've, I've used on this slide here used uh, 500 mils of cow's milk, so two cups, and they um, added the enzyme um, as a supplement and they showed an 88% reduction in symptoms. So quite a positive study showing here that lactase can be, um, can be helpful. And certainly I think it's something that can give patients a bit of freedom if they're eating out or something they can they can be taking um, the lactase supplement. Then a study that um, I did as part of my PhD, we uh, were looking at the alpha-galactosidase enzyme, which is um, what might be present in uh, the brand name Vino you may have heard of, or there's another brand called Vitacos gas enzyme. Um, we performed a, a randomized trial with 31 patients with IBS. And what we did was we provided them with a three-day low FODMAP diet running and then three days of a high GOS or high galacto oligosaccharide diet, so lots of uh, legumes, pulses, nuts and soy milk. And what we did find, if you look at the graph on the left, was their symptoms were um, better in the first three days while they were on the low FODMAP diet and then they had an increase in symptoms once we gave them the high uh, GOS food. But you can see that increase did not um, um, happen so much in the full dose or in the um, full dose enzyme group. So when they were taking the alpha galactosidase, they had um, better symptom control. And we did find that it significantly reduced symptoms in those that we called GOS sensitive. So those patients who were feeling worse with the high GOS diet. So we would recommend that you could trial this with patients. Um, certainly it would be something you might consider once a patient has done a re-challenge um, and perhaps they've reacted to the high GOS challenge that you've used, maybe um, red kidney beans or something along those lines, you could utilise the enzyme. Another study that um, I conducted as part of my PhD was looking at the addition of glucose to target excess fructose. So the reason that this uh, came about is that there is um, evidence that glucose and fructose can be absorbed together within the small intestine. So the thought was that if we could add extra glucose um, as, as a supplement, for example, um, that uh, it might help to improve absorption of fructose and hence reduce symptoms. Now unfortunately we, we found that it did seem to improve absorption but the symptoms were not improved. So Patients were still symptomatic when they had the additional glucose. Um, and this was shown when we used uh, sugar solutions, but we also saw it when we used whole foods as well. So we're really suggesting that this strategy um, should not be used. Uh, we also tested it with uh, foods that contain fructan or with a, a fructan solution. And again, there was no improvement in symptoms. So considering that uh, by adding glucose we're adding extra sugar into the diet and the fact that symptoms were not improved, we're, we're suggesting that this strategy is not one to recommend. Some other work that we did um, as part of my PhD was looking at the effect of food processing on FODMAP content. 
And really what we found was food processing could reduce the FODMAP content of different uh, food products that we tested. So for example, on the graph on the left, if you look on the, the right side, so artichokes, beetroot, garlic and onion, which were pickled, had a much reduced FODMAP content compared to the fresh version. So this could mean that patients could um, have some pickled onion, for example, and they may tolerate that better than, than fresh onion. Similarly with canned products, so this uh, graph on the right here is with red kidney beans. We saw that canned red kidney beans were much lower in FODMAP content compared to dried and cooked red kidney beans. So this here is a, a strategy that might be helpful for patients, but it would be something we'd suggest um, that um, you, you use some individual tolerance testing. Uh, so perhaps in a patient who really likes red kidney beans, you could try some canned versions with them and see how they go. And we also looked at the cooking and how cooking could affect FODMAP content. So again here we're using some, some legumes or pulses. So the graph on the left looked at red lentils and on the graph on the right you've got red kidney beans. So what we saw here was with the red kidney beans, so with a larger sized uh, legume or pulse, uh, we found that by cooking it for longer period of time, so if you compare 5 minutes to 30 minutes, you did see a reduction in FODMAP content of the red kidney beans. And it was present, the FODMAP content was present in the strained liquid. So this would be an example where you have a patient who um, you know, might be vegetarian and really needs some, some good protein sources. Maybe that patient could be cooking their red kidney beans for a bit longer and strain them after cooking and that actually might help to improve their tolerance. We didn't see so much the effect in the red lentils and we think that that's purely related to the size of the, the different legumes. So perhaps in red lentils because they're smaller, the, um, the FODMAP content has moved out into the, the water or the cooking liquid much quicker. So the longer length of time has not um, had an effect. But you can see the strained liquid there still does um, contain FODMAP content. So perhaps by straining after cooking, uh, the patient may tolerate it better. Um, so finally I've just popped to individualise the approach to the patients and I think the more you use the diet in practice the more comfortable you become with individualising and altering the recommendations based on the patient. So uh, for example we talked about before maybe using a simpler version so rather than using the full dietary approach uh, for example in an older patient if you've uh, got someone who is a bit older but eats a lot of garlic and onion and, and wheat products, maybe you could just take those out of the diet to start with and just see if that's enough to reduce their symptoms without them having to worry too much about lots of different foods. Uh, you might select uh, foods based on their habitual diet or their usual diet. So uh, maybe there are certain foods they're having a lot of. For example, I've had a patient who um, was just chewing a lot of chewing gum that contained sorbitol. You know, a, a young girl um, chewing gum all the day, all throughout the day, and simply taking that out made a big difference. Um, and what I do find is the more that you can alter your recommendations or talk about the recommendations um, along with what the patient has preference for, it can really help to improve compliance. Um, and you're more likely to get a better outcome um, if you can sort of individualise it and, and relate it back to what the patient is currently eating. Um, other thoughts are certainly the more supportive education and information you can give them, such as recipe guidance or shopping lists, or sometimes it can be helpful just to run through what a typical day looks like for them and what they're usually eating and just suggest things that they could swap in and out of their diet to reduce the FODMAP um, intake. Important to make sure patients are not over restricting their diet. So we don't want patients to be on a low FODMAP, gluten free, dairy free, paleo diet. Um, we want them just to be having as varied a diet as we can. So trying to avoid accumulation of dietary restrictions. 
Um, and sometimes I find in practice, you know, patients come in, they're already on, on different diets that, that perhaps you might not recommend. And it's, it's about working with the patient around their preferences and trying to, trying to work it in to, to what will suit their needs, but also um, what you think is going to help their symptoms most. Um, I think it is important to talk to patients from the beginning about the three phases of the diet and just explaining that um, you don't want them to be on a diet in the long term. It's important that they come back to see you and talk about re-challenging and interpreting the re-challenge approach. I think if we tell them that from the onset, it's helpful because sometimes I think patients, they feel good on the diet, so they say to themselves, why would I re-challenge? I feel great. I can just stay on this. I'm, I'm good. Um, and, and then they don't come back to see you, and, and that's where you potentially having effect on the microbiome or their nutritional adequacy um, because they're not re-challenging. You can also talk to patients about um, um, their expectations around symptom response. So for example, if they've got a little bit of bloating or a little bit of gas, that's perfectly normal. Um, and also appropriately implementing some of those adjunct therapies, whether or not it be the enzyme therapies or perhaps um, altering cooking or food processing. I think we have another question break here and then just a few final slides to finish up. Uh, yes, so uh, one question is, have you seen a trend toward people with lactose intolerance also being re reactive to other FODMAPs? Uh, yes, yeah, so certainly uh, some patients will be uh, reacting to lactose and also other FODMAPs. That um, certainly can be the case. Uh, but in other cases, some patients might just be reacting to lactose alone. Um, and that's where maybe if you um, have a look at their habitual diet and look at their symptoms, you, you know, maybe the patient thinks that, that lactose is a problem to start with. And you could try just a lactose-free diet to start with. And if that doesn't bring enough symptom improvement, then try the low FODMAP diet. Um, but it can sometimes be very difficult to tell from a food diary and symptom diary. So, Sometimes it's best just to try the low FODMAP diet and, and then um, work it out through re-challenge. And then an, a number of people have asked, is it possible to tolerate one food within one of the groups, so such as one fructan, and then not tolerate another? Yeah, so look, we do find that um, certainly, in, for example, I would say fructose and polyol it tends to be fairly similar within the group. Uh, the groups that I would find perhaps there's more variation would be um, the oligosaccharides, so your fructan and galacto-oligosaccharide. And the reason for that is that those groups are longer chain um, or have a slightly longer chain, which means they're not always the same in different foods. So for example, I might get a patient to challenge um, some bread. Um, I might also get them to challenge onion and garlic and do all of them separately. Even though they all contain fructans, they may actually um, react to them differently. So it can be worthwhile um, trialing them, especially if they're foods that the patient um, you know, normally would, would be eating. Thank you. Because we are running short on time, um, if it's okay with you, we can stay and take more questions after, but I will let you go ahead and finish up and, and then finish other questions at that time and maybe even post additional questions later to the Learn page. Sure. Uh, so we've just had a couple of, of um, final slides with a few useful resources, some of which we've uh, talked about a little bit. Um, I have talked a bit about Monash University. Um, they do have some fantastic resources on their website and they've also got the, a food guide or, or booklet that um, you can use in practice um, if, if you're interested. Um, certainly I think the app um, that they've created is a really good resource both um, for me to have as a dietitian but also for patients to have. Um, partially the reason being is it is it is always updated with, with new, um, new foods when, when they're tested and you know that the information is accurate. The app is available um, both on Android and iPhone. I think it's um, approximately an $8 app but it's a one-time payment um, and the um, 
the funds go back into to further research. And they use a traffic light system um, that you can see here and provide information about serving size and also they're testing uh, particular food products. So you can see on the, the, the panel on the right there, there's products from, from the States, for example, um, have been analysed. Finally, they've also got an online training course. So um, if this is an area where you're keen to learn some more information, that, that is something else that um, might be a useful resource for you to know about. And I've just popped some, some further reading there if you're wanting to look at some of the, the scientific literature around it. There's some, some really helpful articles there, um, including um, how to read challenge um, as well. So just a few takeaway points. So the low FODMAP diet has proven efficacy in managing IBS patients and should always be implemented under the guidance of a dietitian. It is a three-phase diet, so initial phase, re-challenge and long-term. And we can be ut utilising various adjunct therapies to individualise the approach, such as enzyme therapy or altering food processing and cooking techniques. Um, so I'd really like to thank everyone for joining. Um, it's been a, a fun uh, webinar and certainly also thank the two teams that I've been lucky to be part of. So the GI research team I'm with currently at Queen's University as well as the Department of Gastroenterology at Monash. Thank you, Dr. Tuck. That was incredible. Um, we really appreciate your time and expertise today. And thank you to our participants to this very important topic. I want to go ahead and give you the CPEU information for those of you um, who are wanting to earn credits. So that is available in the chat pod and um, in the event information page. We will also post this information at the Learn Event page, um, which the link is there for you as well. If you have any questions, please contact me at kdifilip at illinois.edu. Also, a recording of today's webinar will be archived within 48 hours to our YouTube channel, which you can access via the Learn page at learn.extension.org slash events slash 3300. All of our past nutrition and wellness webinars can be viewed and CPU credits earned for up to one year post-webinar. Please visit our nutrition and wellness page for a listing of these webinars as well. Nutrition and Wellness is active on social media and we would love for you to connect with us and continue this conversation on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. These links are available here on this slide. In addition, the Nutrition and Wellness team are very excited to bring you our upcoming webinar, The ABCs of MDIs, Gaining a Working Knowledge of Multiple Daily Injection Insulin Therapy on Wednesday, May 30th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The information can be found on the Learn Events page for that webinar, which I will post in the chat pod as well. For information on the Military Families Nutrition and Wellness, please go to militaryfamilies.extension.org slash nutrition dash and dash wellness. I will now turn it back over to Jen. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you to all the participants for another great online learning event. We invite you to explore all of the learning opportunities that we offer through the Military Families Learning Network, and we encourage you to share them with friends and colleagues. Topic areas include nutrition and wellness, in addition to personal finance, military caregiving, family development, family transitions, network literacy, and community capacity building. We'll leave this room open for another minute or two to allow you to collect any links that you need or make any last comments. And then we invite you to close your browser to leave the event. We hope to see you again soon at another Military Families Learning Network online learning event. Have a great day.
for everyone who is still listening in. Uh, I have collected all of the wonderful questions, and I will be sending these on to Dr. Tuck, so you can watch for a blog post on our Military Families Nutrition and Wellness uh, site, where you can see the answers to all of the questions as a follow-up to this presentation. Thank you, Robin. Robin has posted a link to the Nutrition and Wellness blog, and that's where the questions and answers from this session that maybe weren't able to be addressed in the live webinar, the answers will be posted there. Thank you again for joining us. We'll go ahead and close up this room in just one more minute.